Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I, I think I have to adjust it to my height. And also to you and to Daniel for inviting me and all, organizing all this, and, and also our, our various hosts who have sponsored it. Thank you for having me here. It's really nice to be here. It's been seven years. I didn't realize that was seven years ago, but a lot has happened. Um, and in fact, I'm going to start with some news. Which news? There's so much news. Uh, this is news that probably most of you missed, which is that a couple of months ago, John Perry Barlow died. And if you don't know who he was, um, he was a former lyricist for the Grateful Dead, but also he was one of the co-founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which uh, is a internet, sorry, um, an, an internet civil liberties organization. And with his death, with his death, I would argue also uh, signal the end of an era. And he wrote, I mean, that's sort of the era that, that died, um, maybe is articulated best in a manifesto that he wrote in 1996 that immediately went viral and has been quoted ever since, called A Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And for those of you not of the generation to remember or to even know, cyberspace was once, uh, well, was a term that was coined in, I think it, it was the 80s by William Gibson, a science fiction writer who used the term to describe the internet. I have found that, uh, you know, undergraduate students, students below the age of 22 don't know what cyberspace is, but in any case, he did coin this manifesto for the independence of it. And I, I want to read you a, um, a little excerpt from what he wrote. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of steel and flesh, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any method of enforcement. We have a uh, true reason to fear. We are creating a world that all may enter without privilege or, pre or <coughs> prejudice, according accorded by race, economic privilege, military force, or station of birth. Our identities have no bodies. Anyone, anywhere, may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments may have made before. So his utopian and in some ways extraordinarily heartfelt manifesto was pervasive over these 25 years in tech, in tech circ, uh, circles since 96 or even before since you know, the web came into existence as a public platform via the, um, or the internet via the web. And the internet, you know, just to kind of sum up his uh, manifesto, was seen as a superpower that would change the world for the better, empower people, eliminate hierarchies, dismantle elite institutions, and allow you to leave the imperfect wetware of your body behind um, into a post-race, post-gender space of the mind free from all rules. Sound good, right? <laughs> so um, what's shocking is... Uh, Given where we are today, how uh, widespread this cyber libertarian uh, position still is in Silicon Valley and among the technological or the technocratic elite, in the form, I mean, it, it takes different forms. You know, part of it is the free spe uh, speech absolutism that you might see on Twitter, uh, the cluelessness or worse about race and gender online the belief in the inherently product productiveness of disrupting or destroying so-called elites, institutions, you know, from democracy to business to, you know, sort of uh, social sociality itself. And finally, a commitment to an unregulated, ungoverned internet. Yet, as the internet has 
absolutely and fully insinuated itself into all of our lives over the past 25 years, outside of that bubble of Silicon Valley, there's finally a wider recognition that what the internet and digital technology has helped usher in is something much darker. Uh, much darker than even those of us who were skeptics ever uh, expected or hoped for or worried about. And instead of crumbling elites, hierarchies, and gatekeepers, we have greater, and this is stuff you all know, we have greater concentration of wealth and power, a new batch of elite and gatekeepers, deeper political divides, and the rise of right-wing populism and authoritarianism. And I, I would argue that the birth of the internet 25 years ago and all of this, um, this phenomenon that I just mentioned are not unrelated. Just as the tech founders and uh, technocrats promised us all along, and we used to make fun of them, you know, that their products and platforms uh, changed the world, who changed the world. In fact, they did, and they do. Just not in the way that we necessarily would watch. So around the time of Barlow's uh, manifesto in 1996, I had begun making art um, on and about the internet. I was, uh, like, uh, I mean, there were only a few artists who were working with the internet at the time, and we were mostly in conversation with each other, and we and I were really drawn by its possibilities and its promises, and also worried about the market fervor, you know, that kind of uh, was also sort of completely in connected with the growth and with all of the hype surrounding it. Um, which is, I think, very uh, beautifully and precisely described in an essay um, from 1995 called The California Ideology, written by Richard Barlow and uh, Andy Cameron, who talks about you know, the kind of um, milieu and aura of the internet as this bizarre mix of hippie individualism, free market economics, and a deep, uncritical faith in technology. And it seemed to me um, that critical and creative voices were urgently needed to try to uh, push up the boundaries of the new forms that were being developed and to interject critique and context into the conversations that were taking place um, alongside its rapid growth. I'm gonna show one small piece that I made around that time that to me has uncanny renewed relevance today. Um, and it's just a, a simple little piece um, that no longer fully runs as uh, you know, most work that was made around that time on the internet um, you know, so it has, that, has that same problem, but it's, it's called Searching for the Truth. And I made it in um, 2000. And it um, reflects on the role of search engine algorithms in determining what counts as truth. At the time, there were at least nine active search engines, and I did a um, search. I was going to say I did a Google search because we automatically, you know, sort of we don't separate the search from Google anymore. But in fact, uh, Google was, you know, one of one of many at that time. So I did a search for tr the word truth uh, using all the different search engines, and then I I uh, display here uh, the number of truths. Um, given to me, returned to me by each search engine. And then I just put them chronologically, and if you hover over each one, you'll see the name of the search engine at the that existed at the time. Most of them don't anymore. So the top um, search engine that gave me 3 million, et cetera, uh, truths was called InfoSeek. <laughs> Google is, is 14,000. Uh, but that Google, you know, still works because now we have one search engine. So if you click on Google now, instead of 14,000, you get 8 million, uh, 500,000 and what. So um, more truth today than we had back in 2000. And uh, 666 is Yahoo, by the way. <laughs> so I don't know what that means, but there's some conspiracy theory that somebody could probably draw from that. So... The point is uh, that today we have one, uh, and we have a few others, but one dominates, and one determines what information rises to the top, 
with <coughs> algorithms that are invisible and proprietary. And uh, you know, in part, I would, I would argue that because of the ubiquity of algorithmic filtering of what counts as knowledge of, and truth, truth of fact has become so uh, relativized and so personalized that even photographs of traumatized children separated by Trump zero uh, tolerance policy are seen by millions in the United States as uh, photoshopped and fabricated. You know, so the fracturing of the truth, you know, the subjectivation, subjectivization of the truth has you know, sort of these profound everyday impact uh, or has a profound everyday impact on, on what's happening in the world today. So for this talk, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna focus only on a body of only well, it's actually quite a large body of work that I made over a decade, um, beginning in 2008. So I'm jumping, you know, sort of way ahead in terms of internet time. It's more like uh, you know epics, um, and I'm gonna talk about this body of work um, from 2008 that I completed in 2017 at the very beginning. So it's it's you know sort of two years ago I finished it. And, during Q&A, you can ask me about new work, but if you feel like it, but you don't have to. Um, but in this body of work that I'm going to focus on, um, I created a, collective, a series of collective portraits of the shared self, uh, drawing from large archives of first-person videos, mostly found online, and in one uh, case, self-produced, uh, to create video montages that attempt to, I mean, I think, you know, the description and the introduction was fabulous, and I could just show some work and leave it at that, but maybe you want a little more. But, you know, I attempt to make visible in the work um, paradoxes and contradictions embedded within the digital documents of the self um, circulating on the Internet. Most of the work that, um, most of the videos that I worked with were found on and made for YouTube, which, like any good Internet company worth its weight in gold promised to give its users a voice and also access to a community. Um, even as its form you know, create, created a more and more narrow personalized spaces for single users, each with her own channel uh, and each with her own recommendations for videos to watch. You know, so like so many uh, you know, platforms at the time, um, there's this promise of of connection and community at the same time as there's this narrowing doubt you know, of, of kind of the construction of the self through the, through the interface and through the platform uh, format you know, that, that you have to work with, and also in terms of what gets returned to you uh, based on your own personal history. You know, so promise of grand, wide, reach, uh, reality of narrow, small uh, self. So in the montages, I try to break out of the algorithmic filters and consider something else, or the ag algorithmic filters, for example, that would give you a row of similar videos. Um, I make rows of similar videos, but I try to make them, making associations that the algorithm might not make, uh, and consider something else about those arrangements and what may emerge from uh, showing a series of similar videos um, side by side. And I'll uh, start uh, by talking about the earliest piece I did uh, in the series from uh, 2009 called Mass Ornament. And I'll say a few words about it and then I'll show you uh, a video of the installation in full. So Mass Ornament is a piece in which I constructed a mass dance from hundreds of videos uh, found online of people dancing by themselves in front of webcams, alone in their rooms, or at least, you know, sort of seemingly alone in their rooms, it appeared to be alone in their rooms of the videos. That uh, the piece is named after an essay by uh, a German critic um, who in 1927, his name is uh, Siegfried Krakauer, in 1927 he wrote an essay called Mass Ornament, um, in which he analyzed a popular entertainment form of the period, which was chorus line dancers. And he argued that uh, the, the reason, well, he argued that the form of the chorus line dancers, uh, row, you know, single row of 
um, similarly dressed, um, simultaneously moving bodies uh, that people watched for entertainment, that it was appreciated because unconsciously uh, people were recognizing that it ref or it reflected the kind of labor that most people or many people were engaged in at the time, which was um, mass production, or you know, it was a period of Fordism where workers in a factory like the dancers uh, standing in a row moved in sync doing the same repetitive labor and over and over to produce something that they had no immediate access to, right? So the dancers produced something that they had no immediate access to, which is this uh, overall, you know, the, aesthetic, the visual overall uh, appearance of what those bodies look like together. So they're fragmented individually to produce something that uh, is produced for someone else. Workers in a factory, he argued, were uh, producing uh, capital, you know, producing something else that they also had no access to, but they were using the labor of their bodies to do that. So I was thinking about what was similar and what was different about the form of these forms of mass entertainment that people were drawn to both making and producing on the internet. You know, and the kind of quintessential throwaway one was people turning at the time there were no smart, minimal smartphones with videos, so people were standing in front of their laptops and desktops and they were performing gestures, or they were dancing, or they, they, were, they were doing things that seemed inconsequential, you know, kind of just uh, uh, ephemeral things that people did to pass the time. But they were all alone when they were doing this thing, but yet uh, they were also uh, together. So I was interested in the way that it, looking at them could also, like you could think about the way uh, the mass was still there as it was in the 1920s and 30s, but it was also dispersed. You know, people were still working because, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about the labor that people produce for free as they upload things to platforms where they don't own the material anymore, where the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the kind of labor that people produce in, all, in, in order to, uh, you know, sort of use the platforms uh, for fun and for free. So anyway, I was trying to make a comparison between those two things, and I also, um, I'll just say something about the sound. I included two soundtracks, um, besides adding also ambient sounds of bodies moving in the space, and they're from films from the 1930s, 1935. One of them is The Gold Diggers of 1930, Buzz, uh, 1935 by Busby Berkeley, uh, which is a film that really, uh, all of Busby Berkeley's films Produce the mass ornament, you know, this abstraction uh, that Krakauer talks about. And it's uh, particular, it was particularly relevant, this film, because it's famous for this, uh, the largest tap dancing sequence that was ever made in film, uh, which were a hundred uh, people were tap dancing simultaneously. So I include that section in the piece. And then I also include uh, Lenny Riefensch, a uh, soundtrack from Lenny Riefensch Stahl's Triumph of the Will, and of course, Lenny Riefensch Stahl was making uh, Nazi propaganda films. Um, so it's this other side of uh, depicting assembled masses. You know, one refers to the aesthetics of the mass, and the other one sort of refers to some of the dangers of the mass. Okay, so I'm going to show you the film. It's actually not a film. I'm going to show you the video, uh, which is uh, generally shown as an installation, uh, but you can get an idea, even though it's not, a, not, not something that I would show in its first instance in the theater. So uh, it's about seven minutes, and if you could lower the lights for that, I'd appreciate it.
Butler writes, and I want to read a quote from her from Notes Towards a Performance, a Performative Theory of Assembly. What does it mean to act together when the conditions for acting together are devastated or falling away? Such an impasse can uh, become the paradoxical form of a, uh, sorry, the paradoxical condition of a form of social solidarity, both mournful and joyful. So if mass ornament is a, or reminiscent of a chorus line, the next body of work that I uh, started working on, also around 2009 and continued until 2017, on and off, uh, is a series uh, mined from online vlogs, which um, had become very popular on YouTube, and many, many more were made than were actually viewed there's much more value to the company, um, Google, uh, who bought it and bought YouTube in, uh, two, two years after it was founded, I think in 2006. Um, but the value for them in, in uh, the videos was less about uh, you know, who was viewing most of the user-generated content, because very few were viewing most. 
know, there are only a few that were viewed a lot and then enhanced by the algorithm, which favored popular videos. But they were used to train uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, and just as an aside, Google's uh, breakthrough in machine learning took place in 2011 uh, when they used, and it was not only because of YouTube, but they used uh, 10 uh, million screen grabs from YouTube videos. You know, at the time they also had enough processing power uh, to be able to uh, sort of have the system start making relationships between data. And if you don't know the story, uh, you know, the th first three things that the machine recognized on its own using YouTube videos isn't really a surprise. One was human faces, the other was human bodies, and the third, can you guess? Cats. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's just an aside. In, in Testament, in the project, uh, I, I don't know if I told you the name, um, Testament, what I was using were basically, or the way I thought about it was I was rescuing unwatched videos and reassembling them into montages where I would um, edit the words and phrases to try to tease out what was only hinted at in the single blogs alone in an attempt to make visible subtexts um, and also to you know, sort of examine the incredibly intimate and raw, unpolished views that people were voluntarily um, you know, sharing um, that revealed this kind of incredible trust that people had with their computers that I think is no longer um, something that you can really witness very much. But you know, this really marks a very particular time, I think, in internet history. And the work also, um, you know, in not what it says, but in what you see, seems to kind of represent this collective longing that people have um, to be seen and heard in public um, expressed in this case in a space where the very idea of community um, has been privatized. So I'm going to show you, I, I made four chapters in total, uh, and they're all uh, video montages that are, are shown generally uh, in projections and spaces. And I'll show you two of them that were made uh, in 2009, and the first is called Laid Off. Um, so 2009 is a year after the the, economic, the, the big uh, global uh, recession. So people are talking about losing their jobs. Um, and then the second one is called My Meds. And together, I'll just go from one to the next, together it's about uh, five minutes. So if you could lower the lights again. Really? I had a new phase sucked in my life. And why does it work? Work any other day. And my clock in card is missing. And uh, so my manager comes up to me. One of my is called me and says, My bosses call me. Yeah. And uh, I what do you do? And, and I, was, I wasn't sure what was going on. I was but, uh, expecting I something down, bad to and happen. Basically, one of the larger people in the company and someone from Human Resources was there. And next thing you know, the hiring manager walked in. And, and he started off with, Well, this is a part of the job I really don't like. And I'm like, Jesse, you What the fuck? Um, and he what's going on? Tell me I'm on the floor. You fired me? Fired. I'm like, No. He says, Yes, we've got to. And they were like, The route's not making enough money. I'm really sorry. When does it start? I'm a really great worker. 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 Over and then they finally the owner cut everybody's hours down to like nothing. And uh, myself and a lot of other people. My center and the other center the is my the entire department. Six hundred people were laid off, which is not a good thing. Due to financial the reasons. The economy and sales are bad. Uh, the economy is so bad. The economy is going out of business. I have to close out of business. My position at work. My Position became yes. redundant. No more. That's how you got it. Position. You got down to I've been removed from my duties. Just been whatever, five, whatever, what, what do you need? They're outsourcing my job. 
I have been working at that place for nine years. Ten years. Two years. Two years. Two years. Eight 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 and it was just like, wow. Can you imagine this came as a shock? And shock. Um, oh, I was up in the three months. Life. I've and always worked hard. I've always given to community and society. I've always worked. You know, really hard. Field the field the field field the field field the the where I conducted myself. I feel the train. How I dealt with people, etc. was very shocking. I didn't realize it was coming. Some people weren't aware of it kind of happening. I didn't see it coming at all. Be so done. So, so <clears throat> some good news is that I'll get a chance to now work on my work on the work, work on my skills to to pursue what I really want. And, and right now, you know, I actually I, I feel kind of kind of liberated. I think it's positive. I feel pretty, positive. Feel pretty good about my situation. I was kind of excited to get the hell out of there. I was kind of looking forward to have a little time. Oh, my hands to make more time to laze around the house. There's clean. Stuff around the house. Really? I think I haven't had enough time to be a reckless fan with in my yard, in my bed, yeah. in my job. Maybe I'll go over there and check out YouTube. Maybe I'll make some videos. Do video blogs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Monday, I'll go to the uh, Virginia Employment Commission, and I'm going to start looking for a new job. I'll probably get a better job. Along with 600 others, I will be also trying to find a job. So yeah, now I'm uh, fighting for my life, basically. I could use your prayers for um, so another job. To say some asshole on top of his car. I don't know what guy is playing right now. Still got his Mercedes and his million pounds. I just trust him that. Uh, Hopefully, they'll let me stay on as a company driver. So, anyway, folks, anyway, that's my story. And uh, pretty much that's about it. And uh, myself, I lose a lot of other people knocking on my door wanting money. That's about it. Anyway, I'm going to turn this camera around, so I'm going to stop. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my patient. I'm on the other side from the grams. milligrams. My sure. level, 50 milligrams once before bedtime. I'm taking two milligrams of 40 milligrams of Prozac and half a milligram of Zodiac at night. I'm in the process of switching medication. From and taking the carbamazepine to Prozac. And now I will take a little later on the And I'm doing much better. So, I mentioned before that I show these in uh, as projections in physical space, but I also put the series, put the work back online where I found it so it can recirculate. So, all of these uh, are also available on YouTube and on Vimeo. And with uh, laid off, I sent this at the time, I don't know if you can still do it in quite the same way, but I sent response videos to everybody that was in the video so they could. Uh, you know, just to see what they would say about what I made about it. And if you go to YouTube, you can see that I think I got maybe two or three comments back from people and everyone else ignored it. Um, uh, so the next uh, work that I want to uh, mention is, and show you a little bit from, is a, a piece that, I, that took me quite a while to make. I started in 2012 and I finished it in 2016. It's a 45 minute film and it's really different than all the others in that instead of uh, using found footage uh, that I located on YouTube, I produced my own archive um, that seemed to me was missing uh, from social media. And I spent a, uh, a year interviewing people using the same forms, using their similar forms to that which I'd used before, but there's really a, quite a big difference in, in what 
uh, comes out of it for various reasons we could talk about. Um, and I interviewed people uh, in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area of San Francisco, um, asking them to talk about their experience of poverty, uh, why they were poor, uh, what they thought should be done, what they thought was missing from conversations about poverty, what they thought the middle class and wealthy needed to know about uh, their experiences, what politicians needed to know. And um, I interviewed people uh, in homeless shelters and food banks and job training centers and collected about 100 videos, which I then uh, animated you know, to create a kind of uh, composite portrait um, of faces and voices of people that were most displaced by the technologies that I was using to amplify. So I was trying to make the connection between, you know, the figures of the internet and the kinds of uh, uh, faces and images that that were that didn't want to be invisible at a time that many people, you know, who had access to technology did want to be invisible. And uh, I also I'll say one other thing about the work. I I wanted to you know use this uh, this kind of collective uh, self. Um, sort of form that I had developed before uh, to uh, counter the very conventional depiction of poverty in the United States, which is uh, that it's, a, it, I mean, it's a story of poverty and it's also how it's represented, which is that it's an individual problem, that it is something that is the, the fault of the individual and that has to be solved by the individual. And so I use this form of overlapping stories and showing connections between the different stories uh, in order to, you know, tell a story of the absolute sociality of, of, of the situation. You know, that even as people are, you know, sort of individuals and in particular, there's also these kinds of larger social uh, sort of uh, forces at work. And the piece itself kind of functions like a, like a, a a musical piece where you have soloists and you have duets and then you have larger choruses. Uh, so I'm only gonna, I'm gonna show you just a, uh, I would say, I'll show you six minutes of it because after that I'm gonna show you, the, uh, talk about the final piece and then show you it in full. But uh, I would say that before I get to that one that I think of this as one side of a coin of which the other one will be the final piece I talk about. Now he's at public and everyone can see. So I, I ju I, I've just made a few selections and so there's a little bit of jumping around in it. You won't notice it because it'll just continue, but I will uh, let six minutes, about six minutes play. Um, what does the general public need to know about learning what limited resources? The general public. Yeah. Yeah. Pass on that one. Okay. It's like you come to a, a fork in the road when you're when you're poor and you're living in, in poverty. And it's like, it feels like you're like backed in the corner when you don't have any don't have money, money to like get um, hygiene and stuff. Wash your clothes, laundry. You don't have no soap. soap or shampoo. You don't have money for toothbrush, toothpaste, and all those different things. And all that other stuff. I'm getting paid minimum wage. Like, we can't even afford to keep a roof over our head. And what then what do you do? do? My name is Melinda Nguyen. My interests are, I love to read. I love knowledge. I love computers. And I like being a mom. I like being a mom too. Um, one thing I really like doing is reading. It takes me out of my situation. It, uh, Oh, it takes me into what, uh, like I said, taking out my situation that I'm in now. 
But even when I'm not in a situation, I still like to read. But I really like to read now more than ever. I like Facebook. <laughs> it also takes me out of the situation. You can be anybody you want to be on a computer. Not that I want to be somebody different, but oh, I sound like I'm contradicting myself. Oh, I don't want to be this one said. <laughs> I like reality shows. But reality shows is reality. You know, you can't I mean, not that they're really reality because they're all edited and stuff, but, you know, what's happening is live, you know, it's them. But in a book, you know, you can create your own ending, you can create your own beginning, you know, even though it's someone else's story that they're telling. And I like that. I grew up in a small town in Arkansas called England, Arkansas, probably just 3,060 people. That was a set of railroad tracks that ran through the middle of the town, whites on one side, blacks on the other. That grew up in on the wrong side of the street. On my side of the street were run down apartments, and then on the opposite side of the street were uptail condos. The whites owned all the property and the farms, and the blacks worked on the farms. But out here in California, I see all the black people. I didn't grow up with many white people around. It was pretty it was much just us. Hispanics, Latinos, a lot of African American, uh, Mexicans on the flatlands. It's not like in a very good neighborhood. Yeah, good areas in LA. And then predominantly um, middle class. Rich people, people, people who have good money, yeah. live in the hills, you know. They don't want to be where the urban people are, you know. They don't want to be where all the poverty is and all the people who are homeless. It's not, you know what I mean, a coincidence. This is not all in the United States. We were, like, pretty much secluded from the regular city, you know. And have it all cornered in and contained right there around the police station. The air even smells different <laughs> for some reason. And, and the police is patrolling to make sure that we don't bother the nice neighborhood. I'll, I'll There's not a lot in the neighborhood. There's nothing positive out here. There's so many people out, out of jobs there, out in the street looking for jobs. I wouldn't see, see in the different suburbs of white neighborhoods. African American men hanging out on the corner. The white guys hanging out at the liquor store. Matter of fact, they didn't even have liquor stores too much in the suburbs. They had liquor barns or, you know. Okay, in my neighborhood. In Compton, it's within a uh, um, two block radius. You have six you liquor stores. stores. We have it's like a liquor store, store on every, every corner. corner. You know, uh, do the math. Okay, I'm going to stop giving my the time that we had. So, what time to go to talk about the last one? So, uh, recent studies and, and whistleblowers have revealed uh, that lies, rumors, conspiracy theories, and scandals spread faster and deeper across networks and generate much more activity um, than other types of, of uh, information or videos or uh, posts on the internet. Um, and that happens without algorithms. That's just what happens when um, something provocative and something scandalous is shared. Now, it is, of course, or not of course, but it is exacerbated by algorithms, which on YouTube, it's been um, revealed recently, uh, they systematically favor divisive, sensationalist, cons and conspiratorial uh, videos. There was actually a whistleblower about like five months ago who was talking about, you know, sort of how the algorithms do this, um, which makes sense in terms of what the platforms are, for, are there for, which is, you know, to serve their bottom line. Those videos are much more, uh, they produce much more activity. You know, there are many more eyeballs, there are many more people who are going to view ads. Uh, so in that kind of an environment, truth can't compete. So if uh, the, this piece I just showed you, long story short, if that represents um, 
those who are judged by society, by I mean, this is really American society. I'm sure there are connections to be found everywhere, but the focus is really American society. Then now he's out in public and everyone can see. The next work I'm going to talk about focuses on the self-appointed judges. And, you know, when I was thinking about it this afternoon, I was thinking about how my talk is kind of talk, speaking about the way that, you know, there's this movement from optimism and the internet, you know, to a kind of a very dark turn. I would say that in my work, there's always been both sides, but this is the darkest piece out of all of the work that I had done. Even though I made it, I first made this work in 2012, which, which in internet time is another era. I remade it um, as a film in 2016, released in 2017, before, just before Trump uh, came into power. Um, and the, the piece itself documents a, a different internet. Um, you know, it was, it was, I would say, a time when uh, it begins to take a turn. And part, in part, so the, the, the vlogs that I collected, um, I collected between 2009-2011. Obama was elected president in, in uh, 2008. And uh, the, I think that the uh, intersection between America voting in its first African-American president and uh, social media exploding and becoming more and more personalized and truth becoming more and more uh, you know, sort of fractured, I think that this, something happens. And you know, this is like an in indication of uh, you know, this turn. In part, the most obvious thing that happens is that America's racist underbelly uh, that was always in existence um, becomes emboldened uh, around the time that Obama is elected. Uh, unified by their, uh, you know, sort of their, their the feeling of, of threat, like of the, that spaces that were once, uh, you know, reserved for white men um, were now being overtaken, you know, by people of color, uh, by a, you know, the most powerful job in, in the world, Obama's uh, position, you know, sort of there was a black man in power. And so you see on the internet, you know, this kind of rise at that time, and on YouTube where I was looking, you know, this rise of, of, of white nationalism, you know, white supremacy. Um, and, you know, there are all of the reasons that we can talk about why this happens, where, you know, people, people who are not nasty in face-to-face -face, uh, communication are nasty on the internet. It's just very easy to be nasty when you don't have a face-to-face -face connection and when you're, you know, sort of, uh, producing a monologue, which is what all YouTube videos are, and what posting on Twitter is in some ways, rather than a dialogue. So, that with that in mind, uh, the work itself, um, I began uh, collecting videos of vloggers who were narrating and performing, re-performing, ranting about um, four different scandals involving African American men that had taken place around the time. And there was a lot of overlap when I listened to the stories where people would talk about one of these media-driven uh, scandals, cons slash some conspiracy theory in there. They would talk about one man, and then all of a sudden it seems like they would be talking about another one. And I became, you know, sort of, I don't know, very attentive to the way that it kept switching and it stopped being about the single person they were describing. And I... Uh, I, I decided to build a composite narrative where I put the scandals together and, and you know, concocted a new scandal, basically, out of, out of those scandals, taking the names out completely, um, and instead focusing on the patterns, uh, the tropes, the kind of language that emerged in the, in the way that people were talking. And one of the things that emerged was that you know, all of the scandals involve a question about the authenticity of the identity of the, of the uh, man in question. And he is either defended or he's attacked, you know, for having crossed a line, some line has been transgressed. And, you know, over the course of the narration, uh, his identity keeps getting constituted and reconstituted, you know, defended and attacked, 
by different uh, collective formations of speakers who often, you know, through the language they use, kind of self-organize into groups, uh, you know, racial and, and gender groups. So when I first uh, showed the piece, I showed it as a, a, a pretty elaborate installation where I had 18 screens around a room, and in order to follow the story, you know, this fractured story that was already a little bit, you know, sort of disassembled, you had to move your body around the room, and you were always, uh, there was always a voice or a face that was out of reach, and so you could never fully grasp it. And on every monitor, there was a single face. So it was different than the other work where you see kind of spatialized montage, you know, where I'm pushing together things that were otherwise isolated. And in this case, everyone has their own, even though there are moments of you know, people assembling around single words or phrases, they're separated. So when I uh, made, the, made this work into a film, it was, it was uh, you know, six months to a year before Trump was elected. And I made it as a film because you couldn't watch the work. I, couldn't, I didn't put it online because it was not possible to see it unless you were in the room because it just wasn't, it didn't translate. And I wanted to try to figure out a way to translate it into film uh, because it seemed to really uh, foreshadow the white backlash that Trump uh, exploited and also this fraught nature of publicness and especially how online you know, sort of race constitutes itself as a category, a scandalous category that just race itself becomes scandal. Uh, and so I, I, uh, you'll see what I ended up doing to try to translate it. There's you know, lots of close-ups of single faces while you hear sound outside of the frame. I have to say, um, I'm not going to say anything else about it except that um, I think that there's some, I mean, when I, when I made it, it was before Trayvon Martin, it was before Black Lives Matter, it was before there were all of the videos that we uh, started to see about uh, you know, black bodies being shot by police uh, that went viral on the internet. And uh, a section of the work is also uh, one of the conspiracy theories is one that Trump started. And at the time that I made the work, he was just a kind of a, a foolish blip on the screen. Like I never, even when I made the film, I never would have imagined, you know, where we are today. Um, and I, uh, when I was asked to show this here, I really wasn't sure I wanted to because I have a very, I find it very difficult to watch right now. Um, it was much easier to watch in 2012. And I remade it because I could, because it just seemed to touch on something, but I think that the thing it touches on is, is raw and we're in such a terrible place right now in the States that I, I don't know if this is a time, I have to just, you know, trigger warning. I don't know, I mean, I find it really hard to watch. And in fact, I'm gonna show you 24 minutes. I'm gonna set my, I don't have a clock, but I'm gonna leave. And we'll let you watch it because it's, I find it really hard to watch right now. So I'm going to show it anyway, but you can tell me what you think. Okay. <clears throat> or maybe I'll stay. <laughs> 